I have a question for you today, a question that God asked me several weeks ago. Several weeks ago, God asked me a question. And when God asked me a question, I find that God is wanting to uh, bring truth into my life and bring me to a place of revelation. And um, actually, which usually happens, when he asked me the question, and I thought I knew the answer to the question, um, and I began to meditate on it, it became a much bigger truth than I realized because what he told me was truth, but then he applied it to my life and brought freedom to an area that I was in bondage that I was blinded to. And it's out of John 8, 36. And it says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So this was the question that God asked me. Did Jesus die for us to do right? Or did Jesus die for us to be free? What do you think the answer to that is? I've asked some people, some people say, well, both. True, to an extent. But the true answer to that question is, he died to set us free. Now, when God begins to bring a truth, sometimes we hear what he is not saying. For example, the, one of the messages that, the God, that God is speaking to the body of Christ today is the message of grace. But when people begin to hear the message of grace, many times they hear, oh, so you're saying I'm free to sin. That is not the message of grace. Because if we know the scriptures, we know that there is no sin and free, there's no freedom in sin. For example, uh, John 8, 34, it, Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And also in Romans 6.14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And it also tells us in Colossians 1.13 that God has delivered us from the kingdom of control and dominion and into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So there is no freedom in sin. So we need to get rid of that. We sometimes think, oh, I have so many rules I have to follow and all that. Well, right there, we're also, then we're under law. And Jesus didn't come for us to still be under the law. He came to fulfill the law that we might be free. Free to sin? No, free not to sin. I have no choice when I'm under the dominion of sin, but to sin. Look at the woman caught in the very act of adultery. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was taught adultery took two people, not one, but they only brought her. So if she was caught in the very act, some, they let the man go, but the woman's going to pay the price for this indiscretion. Huh. So uh, they bring her, the, the Pharisees grab stones to stone her, which rightly so under the law, but Jesus was there. Oh, how blessed that woman was that she was brought before Jesus. So Jesus knelt down, and it says that he wrote in the dirt with his finger. Well, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that said, your sins shall be written in the dirt. So I'm thinking that Jesus possibly wrote the name or names of men that had been with this women, woman. And more than likely, those men were in the crowd with stones, because actually, if they participate in killing her, then no one could come up against him, supposedly, except for the people that caught him in the act. And so... When they all dropped their stones, because he said, he who is without the first stone, go ahead and cast it, throw it. And he didn't, nobody threw them. They dropped their stones and they walked away. This is in, uh, earlier in John chapter eight. And he says to the woman, where are your accusers? And she looks around and she says, well, I have none. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So if there was freedom in sin, or if Jesus was tolerant of her sin, he would have said, well, then go and go on your merry way and continue to sin. But that's not what he said. He said, I don't condemn you, so go and sin no more. She was free not to sin. Isn't that awesome? Free not to sin. I love that. We come into a freedom of Jesus Christ. We are free not to sin. I love it. 
So she went on. So Jesus set her free because she was not under condemnation. So praise God for that truth. So as, we're, as God has spoken this question to me, and I've thought about it, the more that I meditate upon this, this answer, it brings greater, greater truth and freedom to me the more that I see it. Because you see, God began to show me that I had gotten into bondage. Oh, they were good things, they were right things, but it had brought me into bondage. You know, right things and doing good can bring you into bondage. It can, but Jesus didn't come for us to be in bondage. He came to set us free. I'm gonna share a little of my story today. I am divorced. I know, isn't that awful? It's just horrible. Um, those of you that have never been divorced, blessings to you. That is awesome. Those of us that have been divorced um, can testify of the anguish that happened before the divorce happened. Um, I believed God. I prayed. I did everything I knew that I wouldn't end up there, and yet I still ended up divorced. Then there's not only anguish before the divorce, there's anguish after the divorce. And there can be rejection and loneliness and hopelessness. And I mean, all your dreams for the future are now dashed. You're not gonna be with that person. And what's gonna to happen to you? What's gonna to happen to your, your children? I mean, there's all kinds of things and, and rejection that can come and all of this in the body of Christ. But here's good news. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Praise God, praise God. It is not the unpardonable sin. So I was blessed because I was in a loving family and a loving church that I didn't suffer the rejection by any of them by any means, and they were loving and caring to me. So I thank God for that, and I had great support. And um, this happened in my life about eight years ago now. My daughters were like seven, um, 11, and 14. So when this happened, I rightly said, I will step up now and I'm gonna make my household so uh, they're not missing their father because he's not here full time. Um, the girls have been blessed that their father has been a part of their life and they see him every other week and uh, you know he's provided and all those kind of things. So we have been blessed and my situation has not been as bad as it could have been. But um, I decided that I would be provide a stable home for my girls, which I should have. I'm a parent. I needed to be a good parent. Um, I decided they weren't going to miss their father being in the home full time. So here I am stepping up. Now, when this first happened, I said, okay, we can talk about whatever. I didn't know how to minister to my kids. I didn't come from a divorced home, so I had no idea the emotions they were going through. I had no idea the, the thoughts they had, the fears that they were facing, the insecurities. So I said, we're gonna talk about whatever you need to talk about. Your dad and I are separated and then we were divorced. We're not gonna treat this like the elephant in the room um, that nobody talks about and we can talk about this. But with my actions, which were the right thing to do, I was moving in my strength. I'm gonna do this. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be strong. I'm not gonna let my girls see me invincible. I mean, uh, uh, vulnerable. I'm not gonna see my girls, let my girls see me crying and all that because it's not theirs to bear. And true, it is not the children's responsibility to bear the, the weight of the parents. However, read that as hardening my emotions to be strong, I was hardening my emotions. And also, I realized that I had believed God that my marriage wouldn't end up in divorce. I had prayed, I'd believed, I'd stood for years, and then it still ended up there. I had disappointment toward God. I had judged him unfaithful. Me, I had judged him unfaithful. And so by my stepping up in some of these ways, I was protecting God's reputation, but I was also protecting my children from God. I had been hurt. I didn't want my children to be hurt anymore. I'm gonna get in the middle here. It was responsible answers. It was good answers. But what I needed to understand was, you know what? 
I can't take the place of a father. I am not a father. I, so now I, there was two of us in the home, but now there's only one, but I'm going to be like two, and not just like two, I'm also going to be like someone of the opposite sex. It's not possible. I'm a woman. I'm not a man. I can't think like a man. I'm not strong as a man. I, but I determined I was going to do that. So therefore, as my daughters got older, because now they're 15, 20, and 22, um, as they got older, when it came time to maybe put responsibility on them, I, I, I would give them a little, but then I would go, well, you know, if their father was here or there, there was a husband in the home, then he would be doing this heavy stuff, so I need to do that and not bother them. And so then I took on more and more stuff myself to handle. And so as God began to reveal this to me, it began to take loads off of, my, off of me. It began to set me free from bondages. Oh, you can't do that because, you can't do that because. And said, I'm free. Here is an opportunity for the girls to understand, for anybody to understand, you know what? I'm sorry these things have happened in your life. I can't make up for the difference or for that person being gone because I'm not that person but I can connect you, I can make sure, well, I can't make sure, but I can connect you with God, that you can be in relationship with Him, that He can pour in oil and wine into circumstances and into um, wounds that have been caused to you through different circumstances that no one can heal. If you believe that time heals all wounds, that's a lie. Have you met someone that things happened to 50 years ago and they're bitter as they can be? So time isn't a healer. If that were a true statement, then everybody, just as long as you put time in, would be whole. That's not true. God is the healer. God is the repairer of the breach. God is the one that pours in the oil and wine and can make all things new. So I want you to be set free today from bondages that you may have put yourself in to fill a place where someone's in need. Oh, you know, uh, maybe you're, even your children are adults and maybe their lives haven't turned out and so you take on the responsibility, well, I'm sorry my kids have gone through that. Yes, it is sad that your kids have gone through that, but you know what? We need to know God for ourselves. Am I saying that we need to be carefree? Well, Actually, that is what I'm saying, because the word says that in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. But what about worrying about things for the future? Are, are we not to have any worries? Actually, we are not to have worries, because Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25, it's in red, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. You know, need can drive us like crazy. The word, world is full of need, but need is not a call. For those of you that are in the ministry, you need to hear that. Need does not make a call. <clears throat> need is a bottomless pit it is a void that cannot be filled. Um, if I know of a family that's not eating and I have food for my children and I take all the food from my children to give to those that are in need, now hear what I'm saying, and I give everything to those people so now they are eating but then my children have nothing to eat, I filled one need but I created another. And so, yes, we can share and, and, and that can fill them, but that fills them for one meal. But when I connect them with Jesus, he can fulfill all their needs, not man. We are very limited in our resources. We are limited in our time. We're limited in our emotions. We're limited in all these kinds of things, but need will burn you out because you'll be given all your time and all your energy and there will be, it's like there's a million people standing in line. So you take care of one, but now there's 999,999 ,999 more standing in line. 
But being led by the Spirit, let's use that same million. Of course, we know there's many more people in need. Being led by the Spirit of God and being able to minister to people um, like uh, organizations like Samaritan's Purse and uh, others that, that I like to contribute to because I like people to be able to take God into the situation, not just money or not just backs to do uh, um, labor, which that's needed, but then they're still, they're still spiritually in need when, when that situation's over. But when we go in and we take Christ... We can take care of the food need. We can take care of clothing need. We can take care of the back labor need. But we've also brought healing to their soul and maybe even salvation that they never know, knew. Then there is where need is taken care of. So I want you to be free today from all the right things you are doing. God doesn't love you because you're right. He tells us in, in uh, Romans um, 5, 8, I believe, is the reference, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if he loved us when we were at our worst, I know I've said this, but you've got to get this in your spirit. When he loves us when we're at our worst, when he loves us when we're not doing right, how much more he loves us once he's come into our heart and to our spirit? Do I say, oh, then we can just go out and do wrong? No, this isn't about not doing right. It's just, it's just setting us free from the bondage of need and stepping in to be God instead of bringing God into the situation. So the question is, did Jesus die for you to do right? Or did Jesus die for you to be set free? And the answer is, he died for you to be set free. Because he tells us in John 8, 36, for whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Go forth today and be free from the bondages. Ask God to, see, you don't even have to know and think and examine your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any areas that you are in bondage that you can be set free. He is faithful and he will bring it to you. Go forth and be free. God bless you.